So what happened? You hit stop after that already went off because you didn't think I was ready? I didn't think you were starting. I was, and I was calling you out. <laughs> <laughs> and I was ready for the world to hear that Mackie didn't do anything for me for Valentine's Day. We are celebrating Valentine's Day on Friday. Okay, but that's because of me. There was no chocolate today, not a single rose. Not that I really like flowers because they die. I mean, I like flowers a lot, but the cats eat them and then they die and then I let them sit there. I guess and... we could put them out on this balcony here. Yeah. They can't go out there. But nothing. I got nothing today. I'm going to call love? you out. I'm going to call you out. You got my love and I'm going to make you a nice dinner. You make me dinner all the time. This is Mackie. This is what Mackie <laughs> says. I do everything every day for you, which is true. But every day is Valentine's but Day. But you know how much I love special chocolate, and today would have been a great day to surprise me with some special. You used to do that in Philadelphia. I remember when we lived there. You used to, to on Valentine's Day, surprise me with a little treat. Did it cross your mind today? It did cross my mind, but I didn't have the car. So. When you went on your walk to go to the gym, you didn't think, hmm, maybe I should just go across the street to the grocery store and get something. Walking to the grocery store from the gym was an extra 20 minutes. Is it? Yeah. It's that far? It's pretty far. That's a huge parking lot. It's not 20. It's an exaggeration, guys, because I've done that. It's about five extra minutes, but that's well, okay. It's, well, it's about 10 minutes in each direction. Okay, okay there we go. I'll give you that. <laughs> but you owe I me. I didn't have that much time. You owe me a special treat. We're going to talk about special treats today because- so, How romantic is our Valentine's Day? We're going to talk about body composition. Woo woo. Body recomposition. <laughs> yes, body comp and recomp. So we thought it would be fun. This is our version of fun <laughs> to have Mackie ask me all of the questions about body recomposition that I get on a daily basis when I work with clients. And hopefully it's kind of the Cliff Notes version of how to figure out how to change your body composition, if that's something that you want to do. And what we mean by, even mean by body recomposition is if you want to lose weight, lose body fat, gain muscle. Mackie, what is body recomposition? There's really four different ways that you could recomposition your body intentionally on purpose. I guess there's more if you or for things that are detrimental to your health. What do you mean? You could increase your fat and decrease your muscle. That's oh, body yeah, we're recomposition, not... <laughs> but that's true. not a positive change. Got There's it, got four it. potential positive changes, and depending on what your goals are, you might fall somewhere within one of those four categories or maybe even a couple different categories, but each one will require a different stimulus. So the first one would be to decrease your body fat percentage while maintaining muscle mass. The second one would be to increase your muscle mass while maintaining a steady body fat percentage. So increase muscle, maintain fat. Third one, which would be fairly uncommon with people who listen to this podcast probably, would be people who want to increase muscle while also increasing body fat. Just the idea there being that you just want to increase as much muscle mass as possible. Hashtag with bulking. Bulking without... <laughs> any regard to their body fat percentages. It's just like, how much food can I get in? How much muscle can I build without any regard for anything else? So I say that's probably a little bit less common with people that listen to this podcast, just because I would have to guess that most people, if they're looking to gain muscle, would either want to maintain body fat levels or maybe even decrease. And that brings you to the fourth one, which is you're decreasing your body fat while increasing muscle which is probably the most common one that we hear. That's the request that we get the most. And it's also the one that requires the most precision. You'll hear oftentimes that it's not possible to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. It is possible in certain circumstances with very much precision. So it takes a little bit more focus on that. Yeah. And we'll talk about what that would require because I yeah. know that people want to know what kind of precision are we talking about here. Yeah, we'll get into all of that. So the idea here, I'm going to go into some different topics, some different concepts and different things that will go into body recomposition. And then from there, I'll ask you if each thing is overrated or underrated. Ooh, I love a game. A little game. Cool. And you'll be able to explain why. Okay, awesome. 
Let's go. All right. So the first thing on the agenda, let's talk about the idea of being overweight. What does that mean? Okay. So we definitely have an obesity epidemic and not just being obese, but being overweight in this country. It's the majority of people now and it's continuing to grow. Statistically, nearly one in three adults right now are overweight. And I believe it's four in 10 are obese. In the United States. In the United States. Yes, I'm only speaking about the U.S. It definitely extends beyond the U.S. that there is a obesity crisis. To be obese requires you to have a BMI of over 30. And to be overweight, I believe it's above 24. I'd have to double check that. I forget what the number is. It's somewhere in that range. And BMI is a tricky number because it's just a calculation of your height and your weight. And depending on your body composition, how much of your body is muscle and fat, You could be someone who has a higher weight, but your body fat's very low. So then BMI isn't really telling the whole story for someone. However, for the general population, BMI does tell a bit of a story as far as if you're in a healthy range of weight. And we know that excess weight carrying excess body fat can lead to other health complications down the road. It does put you at risk for having more diseases. So I know there's a healthy at every size movement that I am all for. And I think that if you are doing things for your health, like you are exercising and you're eating healthy whole foods, that yes, you can be healthy even if your BMI is high. But when I'm speaking about the majority of the population, Majority of the population are not in that category where they are taking care of themselves in that way. So you're saying that a lot of people are either overweight or obese. What is a way that people can determine what their ideal weight should be? That's a great question because I think oftentimes people have this idea of what their ideal weight should be and it's not accurate and it sets them up for not having success because I We'll say nine out of 10 times I get a client who is saying that they think their ideal weight should be this very low weight that is unattainable, or they haven't attained that weight since they had a stomach virus in college. (laughs) So I think that we do have a natural weight, and it really depends on each person's body type. And if you think back to a weight that you had, perhaps it was college in something beyond the age of 20 that you could hang out at and you didn't have too many fluctuations and you could stay there pretty effortlessly and just maintain it, that's most likely what your ideal weight is. For those who have always been overweight and have been always trying to lose, we want to look at the range that you can be at with your height. And it will depend too on your body composition. If you have a lot of muscle, then you'll be on the heavier end of that range. As long as you're on the leaner side, that's totally fine. I don't think it's always best to try to get to the lowest end of the range. I'm five foot four. Technically, according to the government standards, I should weigh about 120 pounds. But I'm 10 pounds more than that, but my body fat percentage is pretty low. So I have quite a bit of muscle on my body. For me to get to that, that 120 wouldn't even, I would be- You'd be sacrificing health. I would be sacrificing health. I would be starving out of my mind and I wouldn't feel good. So we do need to take into account those types of things when we're talking about what the ideal weight should be for each person. We're up to our first overrated, underrated section. Overrated, underrated when it comes to body recomposition, ideal weight. Overrated. There is no ideal weight. Everybody's going to be different. And we cannot obsess over the scale and it being one, two, three, five pounds. That is natural in a day. You take a shit, you lose a pound or two. You drink a glass of water, you gain a pound or two. The humidity is higher that day. You're swelled up and you're holding on to more water. You eat a carbohydrate. Your body does what it's going to do and it retains more water. So we really cannot obsess over that number. 
Yeah, overweight, body fat percentage, any of those things. It's counterproductive to obsess over those things. Yeah, let that go. (laughs) Go by how you feel. And obviously, how you look in the mirror and be confident in yourself. It's funny. I have to give my clients permission when they either stay the same weight or they might even gain weight because they're gaining muscle and they're changing their body shape. I have to give them permission to be excited and to be proud because their bodies look different and they their bodies are leaner and their clothes fit differently and they're even maybe dropping a size. What are their energy levels like? But the harping of, but the scale says this, we right. cannot dictate our lives based on that number. The scale's irrelevant if all of those other things have gotten where you want them to be. Yeah, it's just that we've been told that that number means so much and has so yeah. so much weight, literally. It does and it doesn't. I don't want to say that we can disregard it completely because it, it is a good marker of trending things that yeah. are happening. It's one data point. Yeah. You can't put everything into that one data point. Exactly. All right. So let's move into the movement side of things. So the first thing up on our agenda for movement is resistance training. What are your thoughts? One of the most powerful tools in changing your body composition is resistance training. I recommend two times per week minimum. If you can do three or four, even better. And you want to be putting stimulus on your body as if your body thinks it's going to die if it doesn't build muscle. That is the kind of stimulation it needs when it resistance trains. So it has to be hard training. And I said this in a podcast prior, hard training looks different for everyone because it depends on your conditioning and where you are. So hard training for an 80-year-old client could look very different than hard training for a 25-year-old client that I'm working with. It looks different and it looks the same, right? Like you're getting to that 80%, 90% to failure. Mm -hmm. You might be able to do a few more reps, but not much more than that. And that could be the two and a half pound weight. It could be body weight for somebody. It could be 100 pounds for another person. Yeah. And the reason why muscle is so powerful, number one, it increases your resting metabolic rate. So all of us have a resting metabolic rate that is based on our age, height, and weight. And this is how many calories you burn just in a completely sedentary, rested, sleeping state. But we have activities that we do, even if you're super sedentary, there's some activities you're doing, like getting up and going to the bathroom or getting into your car and walking across the parking lot. So all of those things even add up to a few extra hundred calories a day. And then when you add in exercise, it increases your caloric expenditure even more every single day. When you increase muscle mass, that resting metabolic rate, which makes up for the majority of the energy your body is burning each day, increases. You hear oftentimes that muscle is metabolically expensive. So it costs your body a lot of energy per day to maintain muscle. So if you are not, as Juliet said, telling your body you're going to die if you don't build muscle, it's not going to want to build muscle. So humans have the amazing ability to adapt. So our bodies are going to adapt to whatever stimulus we give it. So if resistance training is on the menu and that's something that you're doing, your body's going to adapt to that and it's going to build muscle to adapt to that stimulus that you're giving it. And the wonderful thing, too, when I work with beginner clients or someone who's taken a break for a long time from doing something, their body has a much easier and faster time at having results in the beginning because it's this new stimulus. Noob gains. It's noob gains, yeah. Once you get to the point where you've been maintaining and you've had a lot of muscle that you've already put the money in the bank, so to speak, it is actually quite challenging. I don't want to discourage anybody, but I'm over here trying to get the gains and (laughs) it requires quite a bit of extra work and being on top of things versus there's a little more leeway. If you're starting off, you'll see a lot of progress quickly, which I always love working. Which is great. Yeah, I love it. Get results. Yeah. So and you can do it at any age at any time. So just because you have had 50, 60 years, whatever it may be of not building muscle, and not focusing on that, you can do it at any age and you get those noob gains. <laughs> but the other thing too with having more muscle on your body is it will really help shuttle sugars out of your bloodstream. So it's extremely good for your blood sugar, which is one of the most important things when we're talking about body recomposition is making sure that your blood sugar is stable and that it's you're not having an insulin response all the time because that is 
a perfect storm for storing body fat versus your body releasing and losing body fat. So you're saying if we have more muscle on our body, that means that we have a little bit more flexibility when it comes to nutrition? Yes. Yes, actually. And this is not one of those like you can eat whatever you want because you're working out. That that's not the excuse <laughs> to just throw it all away and eat thousands of, of thousands of calories because you had a good workout. But if you create a lot of muscle on your body and your body fat is low and and what is low, that's all relative to because there's too low, which is unhealthy and we're not looking for that. And also, range, we, could also we don't even know what body fat is for most of us because there's it's very hard to even tell unless you get very expensive testing done. Oftentimes going to a laboratory or a college where they're doing DEXA scan, yeah. bod pod, something like that, yeah, which some costs gyms, hundreds of dollars. Yeah, some gyms will give you the in body where you hold on to the handles and it does the bioelectrical impedance to tell you like how much of your body's lean mass versus fat. And there's margins of error in all yeah. of this. But we can see on our body if we are lean or if we have a lot of excess fat, what feels firm and often we feel muscle versus what feels soft and more jiggly is fat. So I prefer to go off of that than like looking at body fat. But just like weight, you can look at that as just what's trending. Is it trending in a direction? Is it maintaining? They're just data points to help you see if what you're doing is working because a lot of times people will do things and they're not getting the return on the investment. But yes, as far as being flexible with food, you can eat more, definitely. And you can get away with having more junky stuff, really. So when it comes to body recomposition, building muscle, resistance training, overrated or underrated? Always underrated. Can't do too much? Well, you can do too much of anything. That's but true. you should definitely, if you're not doing resistance training and you are able to do it, you should do it. Cool. All right, so let's move to the other side of the movement equation. And it's probably the one that most people think of first if they want to lose fat or decrease their overall weight. Most people thinking about body recomposition, they think of cardio. What are your thoughts? Love cardio. I'm a cardio queen over here. But it's definitely not the most effective way to change your body as far as the shape of your body and re and how many times are we going to say recomposition in this podcast? A thousand? <laughs> a lot. It's okay though. <laughs> Don't play a drinking game with this one. <laughs> Cardio is important because we need it for our heart health and we need it for longevity. We know that the one of the biggest markers of longevity is having a high VO2 max. Yep. As far as health goes, we definitely want to make sure that we're getting cardiovascular training. As far as changing our body, losing weight, building muscle. It's not the most effective thing. It can help in creating more of a energy expenditure in a day if you're trying to create a calorie deficit for yourself to lose some weight. But it's not something that we can rely on because often I see people who are doing too much cardio and then all yeah. of that's doing is making them hungrier. And it's way easier to eat 500 calories than it is to burn 500 calories. So we cannot look at cardio as then a way that we can manage just our nutrition. Yeah, I, I always think back on the times when I was teaching indoor cycling classes, seven, eight classes a week, 45 minutes each, doing all of that cardio plus more high intensity cardio on top of that because you can't really work that hard while you're teaching a class and talking to people. So I used to do a lot of cardio and in that time, I was always so hungry and I was eating way more than I was putting out on the bike. Yeah, absolutely. So we really have to decouple cardio in particular and any kind of high calorie burning training with weight loss and fat loss. I think that when we are always connecting them, then we're doing the whole workout to eat and yep. then working out to burn off what we ate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's that downward spiral of okay, I'm going to work out really hard and then I'm so hungry cuz I just worked out so hard and then it just is this circle of I I ate too much now I got to work out then I, I worked out too much now I got to eat yeah, and it's yeah. just this thing that it's a very unhealthy way to be. Yeah, and then I see with women in particular who have hormonal changes that are going into perimenopause or in menopause that excess cardio is increasing their cortisol levels and it's putting a lot of stress on their body and it's doing the opposite effect of what they want 
So they're finding that they're storing more body fat, their body is depleted, it's stressed out, it's not giving a good hormonal response. Mm -hmm. So strength training does the opposite, going back to strength training, where it actually can mimic some of those hormones that are getting low as we get older. It can give that kind of stimulus to the body and really help you build muscle to then keep the body fat down. Because inevitably, for us women, we do gain excess body fat as we get older. Overrated, underrated cardio. Overrated. I'll give it a caveat. I'll say it's overrated for body composition changes, and it's underrated for health. Agree with that 100%. And this is coming from the cardio queen over here. <laughs> <laughs> and then mental health, too. We, can't, yes. we cannot... Yes not count that because that's particularly why I love cardio is it gives me feel good endorphins on a daily basis. But just know that it's not the thing that's going to reshape your body. So we've looked at movement and the different aspects there. And then the other side of the equation, which actually is probably more important and probably will have a bigger impact on your body recomposition changes is nutrition. So where do we want to start? What do we look at when it comes to nutrition? I hate to feel that this is the hardest part for people and that people just want to tune this out because it's like, I know, I know, I know nutrition is the thing that's going to do the most. And yet it's the hardest, at least how people perceive it. So they immediately almost tune it out and in one year out the other. And I want to encourage everybody that we have to change our mindset around this quite a bit. And knowledge is very powerful, but obviously information is not transformation. So I can tell you all of these things and then you have to go and actually try them out for yourself. But don't limit yourself into not even trying some of these things because you feel like, oh, it's just too hard. I just hear that too much where people are like, it's just too hard. I can't do it. It's like you haven't even... That's a story, right? Yeah, it's a story you're telling yourself and you haven't even given it a try. What if you took the pressure off yourself and it wasn't about I need to do this thing for the rest of my life and it has to be perfect. But what if you just had a little bit of experimentation in your diet and you gave yourself the opportunity to try out a different way of eating for a day, yeah. for a meal? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be extreme. I think one of the reasons why people go to that place of, oh, it's too hard for me is because they've tried some extreme version of a diet that's they've cut out 90% of the things that they would normally eat. So I think what we look at is bringing in the sustainability aspect of it. And when you look at what you are eating, you should think, could I do this for the rest of my life? And if the answer is no, I'm going to have to have my cheat days. I'm going to have to maybe just do this for a month and then come off of it. It's not going to be the right path for you. You need to find something that's sustainable that you actually enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. So when we look at nutrition and the things that are going to give you the most improvement overall, number one thing we're looking at is protein. Mm -hmm. Protein is going to help you burn more calories inside your body. It has a thermic effect, it takes a lot of energy to break it down, and it's going to keep you feeling full for the longest. And the satiety factor is huge when it comes yeah. to food because if you're constantly feeling hungry, then there's no way that you're going to be able to keep your energy intake in the proper range. And when I'm talking about energy intake, just another way of me saying calories. So if you are feeling like you eat something and then an hour or two later, you're not satisfied and you're actually hungry again, you're going to have to eat. There's no way that we can willpower our way out of hunger. If you're feeling hungry, it is your biological response to fix that because your brain is signaling that you will die if you don't feed yourself. We are right. animals, so we have to do that. So we have to figure out ways to tell our brain, hey, we have enough food, we are satisfied, and protein is the number one way that we can do that. And it will help you maintain and build muscle. That is the macronutrient that does that, rebuilds your body and repairs your body. So that is number one as far right. as the macronutrient we want to focus on the most for body recomposition. And when you look at your resistance training, going back to the resistance training, if you're not consuming enough protein, 
the body's not going to be able to adapt. It's not going to be able to do its thing when it comes to building the muscle and adapting to that stimulus. Yeah. So you're putting in all this hard effort and then you're not actually building muscle, which is super defeating and sucks to be spending some hours putting in the work and then you're not getting the return on the investment with simply increasing your protein intake, you will get so much for doing that. You will feel so much better. It helps many of my clients feel less brain fog. They feel like they have more energy because their blood sugar is more stable. And what Mackie and I recommend is that you start your day off with a very high protein breakfast. And really, all three meals should be centered around what's your main source of protein. And then you can not have to worry too much about the snacks, except for sprinkling it in with your snacks. Because if you're just having, let's say, a cookie for a snack or some chips or pretzels as a snack, chances are that you're going to feel like you want to eat more of that food because it's not satisfying. The satiety isn't there because those foods are not going to make you feel full. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point when you look at people who struggle to get the minimum protein that they're trying to get. That's because they're either skipping meals or not getting protein in all of their meals. So if you spread it out over the course of the day, it's a lot easier because because protein is so satisfying and sati- satiating. Say that again. Satiating. Ten times fast. Satisfying and satiating. <laughs> because protein is so satiating, you're not going to be able to eat a ton of it at one time. You're going to get full. Yeah. And quality is very important because I can already hear people being like, but like red meat is bad for you, right? And the thing is with meat in particular, it's about the quality and the quantity. When there are studies done on red meat in particular that are sharing that there are negative health impacts, they're looking at a large collection of data around people who are eating the standard American diets of very high fat, poor quality red meat in conjunction with other foods like your typical burger and french fries. They're not isolating that somebody is eating a good quality, let's say grass fed 90-10 piece of red meat, which has a ton of positive health benefits if you look at that data. So there's a lot of these kind of blanket statements to say this is good and this is bad, but we but those are cherry pick data points that we need to actually look beyond that and see who were the people in those studies? What else were they doing? What was the quality of that? Did they do any exercise even? So there are no, a lot they of they didn't ask. That study that you're referencing in particular, all they did was ask people, hey, did you eat red meat this week? Mm-hmm. And then they said yes or no. Not taking into account anything else. Did they eat vegetables as well? Did they eat fiber? Did they do exercise? Was it a hamburger or was it a steak? There's so many different variables there. And we also know blood sugar dysregulation is the leading cause of any metabolic dysfunction. And blood sugar dysregulation happens when we are having too many refined carbohydrates in our diet, which is not red meat. That's eating sugars and cookies and French fries, things like that. So protein is the most powerful macronutrient when it comes to changing your body composition. And I get all of my clients on high protein diets, high protein for what their needs are, depending on how much physical activity they're doing and what their goal size is. Where do carbs fall into the equation? Carbs are also a wonderful macronutrient. They're not as powerful as protein as far as body recomposition, but they're really important for energy and we need them for fueling our body. In our country, most of the convenience foods are a little bit higher in carbohydrates than other things. So hence why people have such metabolic dysfunction because they are not getting a good ratio of protein to carb. They're getting mostly carbohydrates and not enough protein. But that doesn't mean that we should be eating no carb or low carb. We just need to be making sure that we're getting the right amount of carbohydrates and in particular fibrous carbohydrates Mm. that keep us full. And fiber is also really important for our gut health. And we know that the microbiome in the gut is such a powerful, we don't even really know the extent of how powerful it is. We're starting to realize now how it's the main driver for so many other things in our body. 
So fiber really helps that. Yeah, when you look at convenience foods, you mentioned that they're usually low in protein. They're also going to be very low in fiber. Yes. So when you're looking at carbohydrates, look to see that you have some fiber in there. It's not to say that you cannot have carbs without them, but be strategic. And with clients, I like to utilize carbohydrates around training. So if you're going to be doing high level of activity, let's say you're going to go to the gym and you're going to work out for an hour, that's a really great time to have carbs before and after. But if you're just sitting around all day, you might not necessarily need to be eating a bag of pretzels and a sandwich or croissant because that food isn't being utilized for fuel, which is what we really want to use carbohydrates for. And also to help us recover. So let's finish off with the fat. What do you think about fats? I think that fats come with your food. You don't have to worry so much about, I specifically need this much fat. Although oftentimes with healthy eaters, we tend to have sometimes a little too much fat in our diet. Not that you can have too much fat and it's harmful. It's just more that fat has the most calories in it. So it goes a long way. If you think that your one tablespoon of peanut butter isn't three, <laughs> you might want to check that because oftentimes it can be. Or if you're snacking on lots of nuts or you know, you're putting tons of cheese on everything, then it's really easy to overdo it on fat. But as far as fat goes, it is important that we get a good amount of it. We Again, not a macronutrient we want to cut out, especially for hormonal health. But when we're talking about all these ratios, I feel like it can be really confusing. So I've told you protein is the main thing we want to focus on. Carbs are important as well, especially around training and giving you energy and fuel. And then fat you're going to get because it just is in a lot of different foods that we eat. Or if you're even doing salad dressing, if you're adding an avocado, if you're putting cheese on stuff, you're typically getting a good amount of fat in your day unless you are cutting that out on purpose, which I do not recommend doing at all. But we tend towards a 40-30-30 ratio, Mackie and I, with clients, which is 40% of your calories comes from carbs, 30% from protein, and 30% from fat. And then a question I get a lot is, do the vegetables count towards that 40% of my daily intake of carbohydrates? And yes, they do, because they are a wonderful source of carbohydrates, giving you tons of fiber. So things like broccoli, kale, all of those foods. The now Fibrous they, veggies. They don't have tons of calories in them, but they do count towards just all the carbs that you get in general. So you can't really, if you're going to eat vegetables, you're eating carbohydrates. Yeah. One more thing when it comes to nutrition, what do you think about nutrient timing? A lot of attention has been focused on intermittent fasting or getting protein right after your workout. There's a lot of schools of thought when it comes to this nutrient timing and looking at when I should be eating and what. What are your thoughts on that? A couple of thoughts. The best nutrition plan is the one you're going to stick to. Same thing with working out, right? So if you overcomplicate this and you have so many rules to follow and you're not going to be able to follow them, then nutrient timing needs to be thrown out the window and be suspended for the time being while we focus on quality of food first and what you're actually eating. But there definitely is something to be said for giving your body a rhythm of food to support your metabolic health. In women in particular, we don't do well fasted. It can really impact our hormonal health. Mm. And there have been studies shown that we have a very different response to fasting than men do. Men come back to baseline a lot slower. Women come back a lot quicker, especially after exercise. We need to make sure that we are refueling our body in order to get the most out of our training and also fueling pre-training to be able to get the most in the actual session. For men, studies have shown that fasting can be beneficial in some ways. It can help to decrease your caloric intake overall for the whole day if you're pushing your meals out later because you can't eat that much within the short amount of time that you have. It's hard to get your protein in. It is hard to get your protein and that's you have to be mindful of that. So if you're only going to be eating in an eight hour window and I'm speaking to men, I really I never encourage any of my female clients to do intermittent fasting. But if you wanted to try it as a guy, you would have to just be really on it with getting your requirements within those meals. <laughs> And it's a lot to eat at one time. So you have to ask yourself, like, is this worth it? Is, is this it? lifestyle something that really works for me? And for some people who have specific jobs, it might work really well for them if they do right. overnight shifts or whatever it may be. Like sometimes 
then that's the food rhythm that you're in. But as far as that goes, depending on what your lifestyle is, you're going to have a different rhythm, but get in a rhythm is what I recommend Mm. for people to do. I have a very specific rhythm with how my days go. And so I pretty much eat around the same times every single day. My body knows when to expect food. And another thing that you do well is that you limit your choices when it comes to your food. So you have your protein breakfast that you have every day, and it's been the same for 10 years. So you don't have to... I'm like Steve do... Jobs with a turtleneck. Right, right. And I'm doing it with my protein breakfast. You're, you're not wasting <laughs> mental energy on deciding on what you're going to eat because you know what you're going to eat because it's the same thing that you did yesterday and the day before. Very true. And I know for many people that does that's really not appealing. It's not appealing for me for lunch and dinner, but that is one meal that I don't really care that much about. It's fine. It's good enough. And I'm always so busy in the morning. And I think this is for many people, especially those who have kids, that you're running out the door. You don't have time to think, ooh, what do I want for breakfast today? It's not like you're on a holiday and you can go down to the buffet and you're like, I'm going to have eggs. Maybe tomorrow I'll have yogurt. So for me, it is much easier to just have that one or two options that I know work in the morning and I have them always in the house. I even travel with them if I need to travel for work. And then lunch and dinner can be a revolving thing where I have a dozen different things that I revolve through. And then even when it comes to eating out where I will pick up a lunch, I know, okay, that lunch has a great macronutrient profile. I can get a good amount of carbs, protein, a little bit of fat, So it doesn't really have to be that complicated and we can have variety, but we do need to understand what macronutrients are and what they do and how to put the meals together. So one of the things I recommend to people when it comes to grocery shopping, plan what proteins you're going to get, then think about what carbs you want as your sides, and then think about the vegetables that you want to have go with those meals. And then the fat, it'll just happen. The fat's there. It's going to happen. Yeah. If you do that, then you will be able to be well on your way to having more balanced meals that are within that 40-30-30 ratio. And that ratio is a general recommendation that I make for most people who are working out a few times per week for their health. But if you're someone who's hard training or you have something specific you want to train for, then those macronutrient ratios change because of that. Yeah. All right. So let's finish out with a rapid fire overrated, underrated. I'm going to go through the different pieces. Yeah, because we have to feed the cat. Martha, Being Martha someone is someone who's hungry. really hungry for her protein. <laughs> she needs our protein. cat is, All is, she eats is protein. screaming at us. She's on a carnivore diet. <laughs> uh, okay, so we'll start at the top where we began. Protein, overrated, underrated. Underrated. Cutting carbs. Overrated. 100% overrated. Yeah. Cutting carbs is not where it's at. Fat. Overrated or underrated? Yeah. Overrated because people are obsessed with like keto diets and Mm. fat being the best thing ever. Fat is going to oftentimes be why people aren't losing weight because they're just loading up on calories and they don't need as much as they think they do. Your salad doesn't have to have a cup of nuts and cheese on it and avocado and olive oil. All right, this is a big umbrella. It includes eating different macros at different times of the day and also things like intermittent fasting. Nutrient timing. Nutrient timing is underrated. I think it's important. Interesting. I do think well, it's I do think it's important to get on a food rhythm. That's what I call it with people. It's a rhythm of when you're eating and because oftentimes if you leave that up to just eating when I feel like it, you will then overeat later or you won't have enough time in your day to get the nutrients that you need, like the protein. And also setting yourself up for success when it comes to your workouts or your movement. Exactly. Some people might do really well on it fasted or other people might need to have me. I need to have at least 50 to 75 grams of carbs before I go work out. Otherwise, I have no energy. If you're hard training, you most likely will benefit from having food in your system and some carbohydrates if you're hard training as well as some protein. Don't overthink the whole, what should I have pre-workout? What should I have post-workout? If you're getting balanced meals, that's what's most important. I think Uh, that that's something that people get really hung up on, the perfectionism of the pre and post-workout food. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Final piece on the overrated, underrated nutrition side of things, fiber. I mean, I don't hear it talked, so I think it's underrated. 
Yes. It's really important important for our health. Yep. And if you're getting a variety of fruits and vegetables, and that's right, I said it, fruits. (laughs) I know people are, they'd be scared of that fructose, but is those are, you're getting vitamins and minerals. The last thing we should be worried about as a culture is being afraid that a fucking apple is going to make us fat and sick. We are already fat and sick and it ain't from eating apples. That's right. And the apple, you're getting the fructose, but you're getting pectin, you're getting amazing fiber, you're getting vitamins. So we're so silly with what we demonize as far as food goes in this country and then what we think is allowed. And what's and it's a lot of marketing. So we've talked about the nutrition. We've talked about intentional movement when it comes to exercise. Let's look at the other side of movement, which is non-exercise activity, which I think is, well, we'll see if you think it's overrated or underrated, but I think it's underrated when it comes to body recomposition. What do you think? Hugely underrated. Many people are getting less than 5,000 steps per day because our Lifestyle, especially if you're working from home, requires very little of you to get up and do anything. You could do everything from a chair these days. You could lie down all day if you want and still live your life. And you could get DoorDash and everything Amazon delivered to you. And it doesn't require as much effort. In our hunter-gatherer days, although we didn't live very long then. <laughs> we didn't live longer then because we didn't have antibiotics. Yeah, we got injured. <laughs> or yeah, or we had a severe injury that we couldn't treat. But in those days, we were getting 20,000 steps or more just moving around and collecting the things that we would need for the day. And we are meant to do that as human beings. That's what we are supposed to be doing is moving our bodies and There's a lot of chronic pain that people experience from sitting too much and not moving. We need it for circulation. There's so many reasons why we need to be moving more. And so as far as non-exercise activity, which typically is going to come from steps, I highly, highly encourage that as a way to help yourself lose weight if you need to lose weight without putting too much stress on your body. Walking is totally underrated. There was a study that came out recently where somebody did thousands of basically body weight calf raises like while sit- seated in a chair just lifting their heel off the ground they would do i think a thousand a day i forget exactly what the number was but it was a lot in a day and they actually lost a lot of weight just by doing that small little movement yeah. while they're fidgeting, fidgeting. moving yeah. all of that stuff counts towards that non-exercise activity and the more sedentary we become the less our body wants to even do those things. So movement creates more movement. So if you're somebody who is starting to get more in, you'll feel that your body starts to actually want to move on its own and it can't sit still because it's not meant to sit still. All right. Any final thoughts on body recomposition? Well, just going going back to what you were talking about, like the precision of if you're someone who's trying to gain muscle, but also lose body fat, we touched on it a little bit that in the beginning, it's much easier to have those adaptations. But as you are someone who's been training a long time, it can be a little bit more effort. And it just requires you to be very specific with how many calories you're putting into your body, the protein, the type of training that you're doing resistance-wise, and how much stimulus you're getting. So it's definitely not, it's not that it cannot be done, but it requires a little bit more thoughtfulness So this is why I would rather somebody maybe gain even a tiny bit of body fat if they're putting on a ton of muscle and then they can go on a little bit of a cut and then lose it after because building muscle is something that becomes increasingly harder as we get older and we cannot be scared of just like a little bit of body fat. You won't even notice a percent of body fat. It's not a big deal. Yeah. You'll actually probably think, wow, I look even better because my shape has changed and I have more muscles that are showing. So I'm not too worried about that. And we have to eat in order to build muscle and constantly being in a calorie restriction is the reason why many people don't get results. They have low energy availability, especially women who think Mm. like less is always better. And I cannot tell you how many times that I increase the intake for women in particular protein And they see the changes finally after years of spinning their wheels and actually seeing 
less and less results the lower their calories go. We respond well to actually eating and giving ourselves the energy that is required to put on muscle. And what's interesting too, typically in those circumstances, their workouts actually become less intense. Yeah, because you don't even realize that it's happening because your body is taking the path of least resistance because yeah. that's what it needs to do for survival. So you become more sedentary. You're not apt to move as more. You have less energy expenditure and you just have low energy availability. I just wanted to bring it back to that, that body recomposition, it will require you to take in the food necessary to make that happen. And we cannot be afraid of that. It will only make you feel better, more energized, and you will get the body composition that you want. It's your fuel. It's the fuel. Yes. So I hope that we answered your questions around that. And if you have any other questions that we didn't cover here, feel free to reach out to us. If you like what you hear, please subscribe if you haven't done so already to the podcast, as well as rate and review it because that helps the show get seen more and share it, share it with your friends, share it with your family. And as always, thank you so much for listening. And next time, hopefully we'll have our actual podcast studio set up right now. This is the studio. This is my desk. In our new home, but it just is full of boxes and it's the one room that we haven't unpacked yet. So that's the goal for this weekend. All right. See y'all later. Happy Valentine's Day.